So I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order and I just want to welcome everybody to this joint meeting with our City Council and uh, James City County School uh, Board of Supervisors and also extend a warm welcome to members of our community that have taken time out of their morning to spend their time with us this morning and hear the discussion and the presentation on our fiscal year 23 school division budget. Uh, with that, Ms. Aller, would you call the roll? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mrs. Hunley. Here. Mrs. Ortigo. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Mr. Dow. Here. Thank you. Mayor Pons. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, Ms. Felica, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Rogers. Here. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Mayor Pons. Here. Vice Mayor Dett. Here. Mr. Maslin. Here. Got everybody. I called the Board of Supervisors into order for this joint meeting. Mr. Stevens, would you please call the roll? Uh, Mr. Eisenhower. Here. Ms. Larson. Here. Ms. Sadler. Here. Um, Chairman McLennan and Supervisor Hipples send their regards as they're unable to attend today due to scheduling conflicts. Thank you all. And without any further ado, if I can turn it over to Dr. Herring. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mayor Pons and City Council members, Vice Chair Sadler, members of the Board of Supervisors and members of the School Board. This morning we are delighted to present the Superintendent's proposed budget which supports over 11,000 students, 395 pre-K students, 16 schools and more than 1,900 employees. Our schools are an integral part of the City of Williamsburg and James City County and we are fortunate to have the strong support of our community business leaders, families, and elected officials. James City County and the City of Williamsburg have consistently invested in our schools, our teachers, and our students. Dr. Aaron, can you bring it a little closer? James City County and the City of Williamsburg have consistently invested in our schools, our teachers, and our students. Collectively, they fund 60, over 60% 60 of our budget. WJCC Schools receives about 29% of its funding from the state, plus almost 10% in state sales tax earmarked for education. Federal funding provides less than half a percent of the WJCC Schools' annual operating revenue. WJCC Schools is a fully accredited school division, and the proposed budget will enable us to build on that strong history of achievement and continue to address the learning loss caused by the pandemic. <clears throat> the fiscal year 23 proposed budget is aligned with the goals of the strategic plan, Elevate Beyond Excellence. Our priorities include meeting the needs of all students, safety and security, employee compensation, and most of all, teaching and learning. The proposed budget reallocates positions to the operating budget previously funded by the American Rescue Plan grant. In support of goal one, focused on academic achievement, the budget includes in transitioning nine teachers to the operating budget to maintain class size at the WJCC teacher to student ratios. In support of goal four, it moves four counselor positions into the operating budget to sustain the 250 students to one counselor ratio recommended by the American School Counselor Association. Continuing to invest in educational equity in support of goal two, it includes six special education teachers and seven special education teacher aides to comply with staffing ratios. Our greatest resource in WJCC schools is our people. Our teachers and administrators and staff have given all they have to sustain in-person learning this year. Retaining our excellent, dedicated employees and attracting new employees is a primary focus of this year's budget. Teachers, administrators, support employees all contribute to the positive environment that makes it possible for every student to learn. Therefore, in alignment with Strategic Goal 5, this budget includes an investment of over $7 million in our valued employees to move, to move us closer to the regional market average in salaries. Quality teachers are an incredibly short supply, as are bus drivers, custodial staff, and support staff. 
Many have retired or resigned due to the pandemic. If we are to attract and ret retain the best employees, we must compensate our employees competitively. In teacher compensation, WJCC teachers with a master's degree with five to 15 years of experience are currently sixth or last in compensation in the region, with salaries at five to seven percent below the average. We've made ground, some ground in entry level teacher salaries, but many new teachers come to us with 10 to 15 years of experience. Just this month, we have 59 vacant positions across the organization, 17 instructional positions, eight of those are teachers, 16 positions in transportation, bus drivers and bus aides, 10 custodial positions, several specialized services positions such as speech language pathologists, and other support positions posted and currently unfilled. We simply must invest in retaining and attracting new talent to WJCC schools. The budget also sustains our investment in quality health insurance. Currently, 27% of the operating budget is allocated to employee benefits, and more than 18 million of that directly supports health insurance. For each full-time employee who elects family coverage, WJCC contributes over 18,000 per year. Health insurance rates have risen 5% over last year, and the majority of this increase will be passed to employees. Our employees select insurance based on their family's needs, and more than 30% do not elect health insurance through the school division. A salary increase, on the other hand, impacts 100% of our staff and has residual benefits on retirement for years to come. Therefore, our emphasis is on salary first. This budget proposal is informed by data. For example, we will highlight comparative data on teacher compensation, staffing ratios, and new positions this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a budget of need. We know that with full funding, we will be able to meet the essential needs of our students and appropriately compensate our incredibly talented employees. Ms. Ewing, Chief Financial Officer, will now join me in presenting the Superintendent's proposed budget this morning. If possible, I would like you to hold all questions until the end of the presentation so that we may lay out the plan in its entirety. Ms. Ewing, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good morning, everyone. As Dr. Heron stated, we'll be sharing the Superintendent's proposed budget for fiscal year 23 this morning as presented to the school board on February 15th. This budget is based on Governor Northam's introduced budget, so the state revenue information is likely to change once the general assembly. Excuse me, Ms. Ewing, can you speak into the mic a little more? We almost can't hear you here. I'm not sure I can get much closer. Is this any better? <laughs> That's much better. <laughs> much better? Okay. You could, yeah, it can pull towards you, but having the mic really close to your mouth will help us a lot in okay. hearing. This budget is based on Governor Northam's introduced budget, so the state revenue information is likely to change once the General Assembly adopts a final budget. As you know, state code requires the superintendent to prepare a needs-based budget to present to the school board for consideration. This is a data-driven estimate of what is required to provide the highest quality education possible to the children of our community. Considerable work has gone into developing the superintendent's proposed budget with the process beginning in October until the presentation of the superintendent's proposed budget in February. The fiscal year 23 plan is a balance of meeting established school board priorities related to the strategic plan, elevate beyond excellence, a review of available revenue, and meeting increased student and division needs for the upcoming fiscal year. As you might imagine, the ongoing pandemic is resulting in increased student needs in many areas. Our staff continues to go above and beyond to, stir, to serve students in both the virtual and in-person learning environments. We are thankful for both the leadership and financial support you have provided to our community and schools during the pandemic, and we look forward to our continued partnership throughout the budget development process. The Local Composite Index, or LCI, is the state's measurement of each locality's ability to pay for public education. The formula takes into consideration the changes in property values and taxes, 
the local income and retail sales and compares it to that for the entire state. Each locality's index is adjusted to maintain an overall statewide local share of 45% and an overall state share of 55%. Much of our funding is derived from a per pupil cost multiplied by one minus the composite index. So the lower the composite index results in more state funding, while a higher composite index would result in less state funding. The LCI is supposed to be an indicator of the wealth of the locality. If it goes up, the locality is deemed to have increased wealth and will be able to provide additional funding to support its programs. The LCI is updated at the start of each biennium. Since our school division serves two localities, we have two LCIs, both of which have decreased for the new biennium. The city of Williamsburg's will change from 0.7459 to 0.7217 and James City Counties is decreasing from 0.5553 to 0.5331 for the 2022-2024 biennium. As you can see on this slide, Williamsburg and James City County have the highest LCI of any locality in our region. Unfortunately, that means fewer state dollars for our schools and an increased dependence on our local funding partners. Understanding that, school administration and the school board work diligently to review data, trends, and essential increases to develop a responsible needs-based budget. Enrollment is a key component of the budget development process. Enrollment estimates drive our estimated revenue and our staffing model. This view provides a historical perspective with regard to enrollment within the division as of September 30th each year. Enrollment fluctuates daily, but September 30th is a benchmarking assessment for funding at the state level. As we plan for fiscal year 23, we believe the most conservative approach for budgeting is to base next year's enrollment on the students that we currently have instead of utilizing the future think enrollment projections. Our current year September 30th enrollment was 11,018, which ended up being slightly higher than future thinks high projection for this year. The superintendent's proposed budget is based on enrollment of 11,018. And although actual enrollment is down as compared to before the start of the pandemic, we need to remember that individual student needs are increasing. And I'd just like also to mention that these numbers do not include the um, preschool students, which are about 395 each year. Currently, our state revenue is based on the governor's introduced budget as estimated to go up by approximately $8 million. Some of the changes reflected in the governor's introduced budget include the following. The most recent estimates of sales tax revenue dedicated to public education. These estimates include both the 1% and the 1 8th percent portion that are appropriated for distribution to school divisions based on school age population. It is projected that we will see an increase of 1.9 million in fiscal year 23 related to sales tax. Technical rebenchmarking updates to the standards of quality or SOQ, incentive categorical and lottery funded accounts for salary, prevailing support costs, inflation, enrollment projections and other technical updates as well as various proposed policy changes. The rebenchmark budget represents the state cost of continuing direct aid programs into the next biennium with updates to the input data like average salary used in the funding formulas that determine the cost of the programs. Since 90% of state direct aid funding is for SOQ programs, SOQ funding is most impacted by the rebenchmarking process. As you can see from this table, our estimated increase in SOQ funding is approximately $3.7 million. Incentive programs will see an increase of approximately 1.5 million. This is primarily due to the grocery tax and rebenchmarking hold harmless, as well as increased funding for students educationally at risk. The governor's budget also provides funding for a 5% compensation supplement effective on July 1st, 2022, and another 5% compensation supplement effective on July 1st, 2023. 
Projected lottery amounts are being used to fund the state's share of various programs, such as the Infrastructure and Operations Per Pupil Fund, Early Reading Intervention, K-3 Primary Class Size Reduction, and SOL Algebra Readiness. We are estimating an increase of approximately 790000 in this area as compared to our adopted fiscal year 22 budget. This is primarily related to an increase in funds to expand the early reading initiative to fourth and fifth grades, as well as the increased funding for students educationally at risk, which is partially funded from lottery funds. One item that is included in Governor Northam's budget, but not reflected here, is state funding for school construction grants in fiscal year 2023, as these funds will be accounted for in our capital projects fund. Our estimated allocation for these grants is $4.6 million. In addition to enrollment data, we used the division's strategic plan to guide the development of the budget to ensure that goal areas are supported. As we go through the presentation and review expenditure increases, those that are considered <coughs> mandatory, which is a statutory or contractually obligated expenditure, are notated with an asterisk. All other expenditures are deemed essential in order to continue to deliver high quality instruction and to sustain division operations. Here you will see the proposed expenditures related to goal one, academic achievement, college and career readiness of the strategic plan. This includes resources to support classroom learning, our annual computer refresh, and our commitment to the New Horizons program, as well as nine elementary teachers in order to maintain our adopted class size ratios. Mr. Walker and Dr. Worley will now join us to share information related to the building leadership personnel requests under this goal. Good morning. In alignment with our division's strategic plan, we are requesting funding for a second assistant principal for Stonehouse Elementary. You will notice on the chart that as of September 30th that our largest elementary school, Stonehouse, has a larger student enrollment than three of our four middle schools with one principal, one assistant principal, and no additional administrative support. The three smaller middle schools also have a second assistant principal and a school improvement specialist position to support administrative duties and responsibilities. For example, one of the most important duties and responsibilities for the assistant principal is serving as the administrative designee for all components of work connected to special education services for his or her school. The chart shows the total number of IEPs for students receiving special education services at Stonehouse Elementary and the comparison to our four middle schools. Adding a second assistant principal for Stonehouse is a much needed resource in supporting the administrative needs of the school and the students. Reading from left to right on the student enrollment chart from January 25th of this year shows our largest schools are certainly the three high schools and then followed next by Stonehouse Elementary School, which is the largest elementary school. As of January 25th, Stonehouse's student enrollment has continued increasing throughout the school year and now has a larger student enrollment than all four middle schools. The next largest elementary school is Metoica with 677 students, which is roughly 100 students less than Stonehouse. An additional point of reference for your awareness is that Stonehouse Elementary is the largest elementary school with the highest student enrollment and number of staff in four school divisions. It is the largest elementary school out of 53 elementary schools in York County, Newport News, Hampton, and of course, WJCC. York County Schools has placed additional administrative support at five of its largest elementary schools with a position similar to our school improvement specialists. And Newport News Schools has assigned a second assistant principal for its larger elementary schools. In closing, Stonehouse Elementary needs a second assistant principal to help provide the best possible leadership, support, supervision, and more to its students, staff, 
and families. Next, Dr. Worley will now share information related to high school assistant principals. Thank you. Good morning. The addition of assistant principals at our high schools supports goal one and goal five of our strategic plan. The current expansion of expectations of our high schools as outlined by the Virginia Department of Education through career and college readiness, the profile of a Virginia graduate, and graduation requirements combined with the growing set of academic needs of our children creates the need for an additional support on administrative teams at our high schools. The responsibilities of instructional leadership, management of daily operations, discipline, increasing number of students with individualized educational plans or 504 plans, and a support for an increased number of at-risk populations, along with the expectation for our administrators to remain visible within the school building. This includes the management and supervision of afternoon and evening activities, as well as our athletic events. They all require more administrative presence than three individuals can cover in one school community. The addition of this an assistant principal at each high school will enhance our overall success and provide critical support and presence for our current leadership teams. This slide highlights a comparison of our like and surrounding school divisions. The first column lists the division name and the second column lists the average number of assistant principals at high schools and the third column reports the average enrollment across the high schools within that division and the last column indicates a like or surrounding regional school. This slide shows needed support for our leadership teams across our high schools. It is essential that we continue to increase administrative visibility within the school building and provide elevated support for our teachers. The addition of an assistant principal at each high school is a priority as this position will provide much needed support to our current leadership teams and therefore to our students, our staff, and our community at large. Thank you. Goal two of the strategic plan focuses on educational equity. Expenditure increases here are primarily for personnel to support the division's special education populations. Ms. Boudreaux will now share information related to the special education positions. Good morning. In order to provide context to the special education mandated needs, we will begin by looking at special education population trends. The numbers presented here are based on the December 1 state reporting document, which is used to determine state and federal funding for special education. The December 1 count for this year shows a very slight reduction of five students. It is important to note that the overall percentage of enrolled students with a disability is 16%. And the number of students with a disability being served in our division as of March 10th is 1,937, an increase of 24 students since December 1st. The number of students served in conjunction with their individual levels of need, drives the staffing requirements for the division. This chart provides trend data for special education staffing over the past eight years. The addition of teachers for fiscal year 22 included teachers to address program requirements and the addition of new self-contained classrooms at the elementary level. In addition, paraprofessionals are, were added to support the self-contained classrooms and to provide students some who are new to our division with mandated services. Virginia regulations and the Virginia standards of quality establish the maximum caseload staffing requirements for special education services for school age children. Caseload standards per teacher or school average per teacher of, for school, caseload standards per teacher or school average per teacher is a maximum of 20 points except for classrooms serving students with autism, deaf blindness, or multiple disabilities for more than 50% of the day, where the caseload maximum is eight students. As this chart indicates, we currently have eight individual teacher caseloads above SOQ maximum and 10 caseloads at capacity. These caseload numbers adjust monthly based on revised IEPs requiring increased services as well as transfer and newly eligible students. 
Our special education teachers have welcomed our students back to five day a week in person instruction. Despite the challenges that have faced all educators this year, teachers have been flexible in their approach to meet the needs of students with disabilities. The Department of Special Education has continued to monitor enrollment and caseloads throughout the first semester. This has required readjusting positions and or reallocating resources to ensure that we are providing appropriate programming for our students. Despite this changing landscape, the dedication from our special education teachers has allowed WJCC schools to continue providing a quality education for our students. The safety and security of students and staff remain a priority as seen in goal four. The budget proposal includes transitioning four school counselors from the ESSER grant funds to the operating budget in order to maintain our staffing ratio of 250 to one, which is the recommended staffing ratio of the National Association of School Counseling. Also under this goal, we've included two psychologist interns in order to build our staffing in this specialized area. This is a paid, full-time, year-long internship under the supervision of our lead school psychologist. Under their guidance, the interns are able to complete evaluations, participate in eligibility meetings, and work directly with students. In order to attract and retain high-quality employees and remain competitive with neighboring divisions, the budget proposal includes an average 7% salary increase for eligible employees. Of this increase, 5% is considered mandatory in order to receive our full revenue allocation from the state, and the additional 2% is essential in order to remain competitive in today's job market. Funding is also requested to maintain the mid-year bus driver pay increase of $1.25 per hour that was provided in the current fiscal year. It is also recommended that stipends be adjusted by an average 5% in order to attract staff to take on these additional duties. And there are also funds allocated for internal equity adjustments within the technology and transportation departments. Additional items under goal five include the recommendation for a special education intensive services stipend as well as WJCC's share of the health insurance cost increase. Our health insurance costs are increasing by 5%, and we plan to share that increase with employees based on a 20% WJCC share and 80% employee share of the increased cost. Finally, under goal five are additional funds to support a rate increase from 3.66% to 4.37%, for our retirement contributions to VRS for our non-professional staff, which includes our custodians, bus drivers, bus aides, and maintenance workers. The most valuable resource the school division has is our employees. These dedicated men and women are amazing and hardworking during a normal school year. Add a pandemic into the mix and they go into overdrive. The challenge is to continue to hire and retain teachers and staff members of this caliber, which is why compensation is so important. Mr. Baker, Senior Director for Human Resources, will now share more information related to compensation. Good morning. For this past school year, our bachelor's degree entry-level teacher started at $44,600, effective July 2020. And then we had a mid-year thousand two hundred sixty nine dollars effective January of 2021 this fall it increased again to forty seven thousand and eighty dollars as a result WJCC is third out of six for the bachelor's entry-level degree for the teachers mr. Baker we're having a tough time hearing you okay. thank you <clears throat> this this slide shows how we compare in different milestone years on the bachelor's degree for teachers. Please note in year five and in year 10, we are five out of six or second to last. And in year 15 and year 20, we are sixth and last. For the master's entry level, we now rank fourth out of six. This ranking is significant because the majority of the teachers we hire have at least a master's.
On this slide, we show how we rank on the master's teacher scale at the beginning of the scale, as well as different milestone years. On the milestone years where we are six out of six or last, we continue to lose ground at each milestone year until by the year 20, we are 8% behind and below the average of the other five school divisions. We are not just last, we are last by a significant amount. For example, one of our teachers with a master's in 20 years of service would earn a salary of $57,405, whereas the average teacher for the other five school divisions would earn $62,098. We are $4,693 behind. Moving on to budgetary expenditures related to goal six, organizational efficiency and effectiveness, you will see funding to support increases in costs for technology software programs and other contractual increases to maintain the security of our network. <coughs> Funds are also included to address anticipated increases in our workers' comp and general liability insurances, as well as an FTE for a data analyst research coordinator. This position will collaborate with WJCC departments to analyze and develop data that assists in program evaluation, identifying economies and efficiencies, and enhanced program accountability. Specific increases related to operations and transportation under Goal 6 include anticipated increases in the cost of school buses, contractual increases, our increased storage space, as well as an FTE for an HVAC controls specialist. This position will proactively manage controls to support utility savings and develop energy conservation measures, schedule and implement preventative maintenance procedures, and respond to all controls-oriented work orders. Also related to goal six, organizational efficiency, we have estimated savings of just under 1.3 million as represented on this slide. The majority of this is related to one-time costs budgeted in fiscal year 22 for trailer costs and increased unemployment costs that will not continue into next fiscal year. This graphic outlines that our focus is right where it should be, instruction. It represents our expenditures by functional area, and instruction makes up 74% of our total budget. In summary, our state revenue increase based on the governor's budget is approximately $8 million. The expenditure increases after factoring in attrition and other savings amount to approximately $9.6 million which results in a funding request to the localities of approximately 1.6 million, which is a net increase of 1.7% over the current fiscal year. As a point of reference, this chart represents our local revenue for the past 10 years. Years with an asterisk in indicate the first year of a biennium. Fiscal year 19 has a higher increase as that is the year that James Blair opened so we have not factored that year into the average increase information that is presented. On average, the percentage increase over these years, not including fiscal year 19, is 2.5%. And the average percentage increase in the first year of a biennium, not including fiscal year 19, is 2.8%. This concludes our formal presentation of the superintendent's proposed budget. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ewing. And before we do that, Dr. Heron, did you have any follow-on comments? Not at this time, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, if there are any questions or comments from the bodies. Ms. Ramsey? So I just have a couple questions related to the growth at Stonehouse. Uh, when was that elementary school built? Does anyone know? Mr. Snipes probably has that information. Mr. Snipes back there? The question is, when was Stonehouse built? Good morning. Stonehouse was built in 2000. 2000, so 20 2000. years ago. 2000. And what was the capacity or for it when it was built? 
we, we, I'd, I'd have to get you that information and, and I can get that to you in the next couple of seconds. Okay. Marcellus, hey. you'll have to speak up, please. I said I, I can get her that information. I can get it to her before in the next couple of minutes. And the other question I had was on page three, talking about the enrollment history, K through 12. It looks like there's a big gap between 2019 and 2020 and where we are now. But in reality, if I'm doing my math correctly, it's only like 4%. You're um, correct in that. Yes, ma'am. And do we know what the breakdown was in elementary, middle school, and high school in 2019, 2020, and what it's anticipated to be in 22, 23? Sure. So in 1920, the elementary enrollment was 5,019, which was 44% of our total enrollment. The middle school enrollment was 2,655, or 23% of the total. And high school enrollment was 3,774, or 33%. And, and do you just want the current year breakdown? Yeah, and sort of what the projection is for this next year. Um, so the budget proposal is based on our current enrollment. So current year enrollment, the elementary enrollment is 4,725, which was 41% of the total. Middle school was 2,585, which is 23% of the total. And high school was 3,708, which is 32% of the total, which was the September 30th enrollment. So I was just curious as to where the numbers were holding from before the pandemic. So thank you very much. Mr. Maslin and then Mr. Eisenhower. Uh, yes, I had two questions. Uh, in terms of our compensation plan, do we have a tuition reimbursement program for our teachers uh, pursuing <coughs> graduate degrees? Yes, sir, we do have uh, a tuition reimbursement program that teachers and other staff are, are eligible to apply for that pays up to six hours, credit hours per year. And then the other question was, we know how well uh, faculty and staff did in the last year in terms of managing expenses below budget. Uh, is there any update in terms of moving forward, uh, fl more flexibility in terms of using the surplus? I believe that's a decision for the bodies and not for the superintendent. Well, was there were some state initiatives uh, going forward <clears throat> that would give more flexibility? Um, there's, there's no flexibility with our use of funds because all funds go back to the county and city at the end of the year. Am I understanding your question? Okay. Drew, Drew anything, any, any new changes there? I'm not sure I understand the question, Mr. Maslin. Well, didn't the state sort of mandate what happens with surplus dollars at the end of the school year? I don't think I'm aware of a state mandate. Um, we have a process that we use for handling the surplus at the end of the year with the school system that usually results in them coming back to the city council and the board of supervisors with a spending plan, a year-end spending plan. Um, over the last few years, we've been talking about how to change that process so that it's better built into the budget overall, but it doesn't involve a state mandate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Eisenhower. Thank you. Um, am I coming through? Yes, sir. Good. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple of um, brief questions. <clears throat> Pardon me. First one was, um, if, do you have any um, idea or uh, ballpark estimate of what your um, FY22 current fiscal year surplus might be? We don't have an exact number, but I think there will be a, a fairly significant surplus okay. because of unfilled positions mainly. Okay, all right. Um, and then two other real quick ones. Uh, I heard mention of $4.6 in state funding for school construction. Was that a grant? And was that, um, I, 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 first I've, I've heard of the state being willing to put anything forward, and can, can you enlighten us a little bit more about that? Yeah, Ms. Ewing may have more information about that. I do know going through the General Assembly, there is potentially some money for construction, and if we're eligible for that, we certainly will apply. Ms. Ewing, do you have any more information on this? The construction I don't fund. have specific information on how those funds would work. It was just part of our revenue allocation under the governor's proposed budget. And our allocation was $4.6 million, and it was to be specific for school construction projects. Okay. Uh, and then uh, my last one before we pass it on to somebody else's. Um, 
question you mentioned 59 vacancies that you currently have of which 17 are teachers and then you listed some of the other um, just out of curiosity um, this budget adds some new full-time equivalents or uh, FTEs I guess across um, and we've heard about some of them being assistant principals and, and some of them being in special education uh, counselors things like that um, how many FTEs uh, across the budget are being being added and and uh, I would gather that none of those are being are teachers because we actually have unfilled slots for teachers right now is that correct we have unfilled slots but in fact there are just eight teacher openings but those are being filled and those are classrooms of students that are being covered by long-term subs at this okay. moment in time so those are still classrooms that are needed the the additional positions miss Ewan can give a total number but there yeah, are that's all I mentioned just total number yeah there are eight eight teachers um, four counselors and the three administration administrative staff are currently in this year being paid for by ESSER funds and we're moving any position slowly into the operating budget over the next several years and the eight positions and teachers were added for the class ratio teacher to student ratio Ms. Ewan do you have a total number yes the total increase in FTEs is 31.19 and of that total 21 FTEs are transitioning from the ESSER grant funds into the operating fund Okay, thank you. Ms. Larson? Hi, thank you. And I'm also looking for head nods, or thank you, sir. Uh, I have a few questions. Is it better just to ask each one by one and then? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> you made the comment that, that we've had, um, you've, you've lost uh, personnel due to the pandemic. I wondered if you had a number on that and what type of what was the feedback what was the the particular issue about the was it the increased workload was it the the worry over getting sick what was the we've lost several staff over the course of this year mr baker may have more definite numbers we certainly have had one who resigned due to the mask mandate uh disappearing um, but others have expressed just the desire that, it, that they didn't want to spend another year in the pandemic, basically. Mr. Baker, do you have any specific numbers? I, I don't. I, mean, I think anecdotally it's over a, a, dozen, a dozen or so folks that have expressed worries, concerns, or issues where they couldn't work for the pandemic, their own medical concerns or reasons. You need to speak into the mic, Mr. Baker. Y yes, ma'am. So we had, I think, over uh, several dozen folks over the last two years who have resigned or retired because of issues re regarding the pandemic if I could follow up as well Ms. Larson we've just literally given our intent to return format that I know you're familiar with as a former school board chair and this for the first time this year we have a a larger number of uh, teachers and other staff not intending to return for a variety of reasons we also have a significantly larger number who at the moment are saying they're not sure if they plan to return to WJCC schools. And I believe uh, from WJCA, our teacher organization, part of that from what they told me just yesterday is they're waiting to see how competitive other salaries are in other divisions. So my concern is we're going to lose a lot of qualified and excellent teachers and other staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you, the Stonehouse um, AP was discussed and then additional high school. You've brought in an additional AP now at Stonehouse, right? We've used uh, ESSER funds to put an extra assistant principal in each high school starting in January, January, February. And uh, we, we also put one in Stonehouse at that time. So are you seeing the results that you want to see with the information that you gave us because you've added the personnel? Yeah, I think it's made an incredible difference in managing uh, special education IEPs. It's distributed the load. We've seen the stress level go down in the, those currently in administration in those schools. Uh, my biggest concern with the students coming back very different to what they left us two years ago um, with that pressure and trying to uh, react to mental health and discipline issues and things like that without 
those extra staff, we probably would have lost APs and principals this year. Okay. And then finally, you, I wanted to go back to what Mrs. Ewing said about the 5% that, that we're, you're supposed to get July 1, I believe, and then this year and then next year. And is that 5% uh, that that's not, what, what's, what, what are you getting from the state? Is that a 5% from the state? Yes, the governor's proposed budget includes a 5% salary supplement. And is that for everyone on your on your payroll, or is that only for your SOQ positions? That is always SOQ positions, and it's 5% each year of the biennium. Uh, we don't know what the final number will be because there is a difference between the Senate and the House in terms of their budget, and I know that's been worked out uh, at this moment in time, so we don't have a final number. Um, but in the governor's proposed budget, is 5% per year for SOQ positions, which it always is. So how many positions above SOQ do you have? That I'm not sure we have an exact number today, Ms. Ewing. Any uh, thoughts? I don't have that information today. If somebody could just send that to me at some point. Well, we can absolutely get okay. it for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Dell. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Ewing and Dr. Heron. I have a question on enrollments, since they would be uh, important in the calculations of contributions from the city and from James City County. It looks like over the course of the pandemic, around 400, maybe around 450 students were lost, and we made up 11,018 as total enrollment in the population from last year. I think it was mentioned that that was slightly higher than a consultant company had predicted, yet it was still in 2023 predicted to be the same number of enrollments. And so I was curious why that is not changing from this year to next year, given that probably has some, uh, some portions of funding around transportation needs, teacher to student ratio needs. Yeah, basically we, we decided to take a conservative approach like we did last year and budget on actual students that we have right now because of the un unpredictable coming back of students. We got many more than we thought. Last year uh, already we are uh, over 30 students above that number, mm -hmm. but we wanted to go into the budget conservatively because the numbers have varied above that number over the course of this year. They have gone up and down. So we were, it's a very conservative approach. My second question was the LCI calculated as a share of, of our contributions versus the state contributions. Both James City County and Williamsburg were reduced by about 0 0.02. Was that, was that across the board? Was that because of COVID? Is there a reason that it was seen from a state level that we were able to contribute less and, and therefore that they need to expend more? I'm going to pass the LCI question to our financial expert, Ms. Ewing. Um, yeah, that's a, a complicated state formula, so lots of different variables go into it. So I'm not sure I can give you one specific reason as to why. Um, I did look at some other localities, and several localities have gone down about the same yeah. overall when I looked at them. Just a curiosity there. I mean, better that the state contributes more, so not, not complaining, but curious as to how that was was calculated. And my third and final question, the 5% the pay increase that was mentioned hitting this year with another subsequently next year, I imagine that's across the board for all school districts in the state. In other words, we would still need to be competitive on top of that provided pay increase? Yes, sir. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Those are all. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Ms. Sadler. Hi. Yes. Good morning. A um, couple of questions regarding ARPA funding. Um, I, forgive me if I've missed this, but uh, do you have an exact amount of, I know there's lots of different um, pools of it coming in, do you have an, an exact amount of how much you're receiving for ARPA funding? And um, it's my understanding, and forgive me if I've missed this, but with uh, um, some of your hired personnel, will that ARPA funding be used for hiring personnel, and, and are they hired on a contingency that it's Temporary, this since it's kind of, if you will, grant funding. What's what's your plan for the the folks that if they are hired on a temporary basis? Are, is that an understanding? Are you expecting them to come back as regularly paid um, staff? How's that going to work? So as we receive the the ARA funds, um, 
or the ARPA funds, we actually created a plan to begin with, with some positions using grant funds first, and then would transition them over the three years into the operating budget. So for example, the extra assistant principals for four of our counselors and eight teachers, we paid for with federal funds, grant funds this year, and they, were, they are transitioned into next year's budget. And then there are other positions we'll transition in next year. So we have used the funds, but there are, we also have a plan to move them off grant funding. Every single person who was hired in a grant funded position was made aware of that at the front end. All right, thank you. And then um, I, I guess this is more of a, um, a project question. Um, with your ARPA funding, um, will you be using any of that? And again, this is maybe more on the CIP level, but. Um, are you going to be using any of that for any current or upcoming projects? There are certain restrictions on the ARPA funds. Um, however, we, all, we have applied for a grant already and received it for the Berkeley HVAC system, $2 million that is now being taken off our CIP and, and, and that has really helped us and, and helped everyone. Um, Ms. Ewan, if you could perhaps speak to the um, the use of funds for construction projects and some of the limitations in terms of time and how that money can be used. Sure, to use the ARPA funds for construction, there are additional approvals that are necessary and also the funds end in September of 2024. So there's a time constraint because the full project would have to be paid. We couldn't pay a portion of a project out of the ARPA funds and pay the rest out of other funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sadler. I'm looking for other comments or questions for our CFO or our superintendent. While you think yeah. on those comments or questions, I think I would just like to add that um, being a part of this uh, budget cycle um, and uh, getting presentations from our CFO and Dr. Heron um, as early as January, of course, each year. Um, I, I would like to offer that I've been incredibly impressed with uh, my board colleagues and the division senior leadership staff and um, looking really hard at the needs of the division and what it would take, what it would require to um, project ourselves and our division, our teachers, our families, our um, students out of the pandemic environment that we've been in. And, and really be forward looking. And that's really been kind of our mantra over the last year uh, for WJCC. So um, we've really looked, and I've been really pleased and proud of, of this board that I've, I'm privileged to serve with, looked long and hard at this budget and um, really have taken to heart the oversight duty that we have, uh, fiduciary duty that we have um, to ensure that what we present and what Dr. Heron presents to us and we offer to our funding partners is in fact a budget of need. And uh, I've been pleased to, to say that it is and I'm pleased to support it. Um, you've heard uh, potentially ad nauseum uh, that the great responsibility we have to attract um, meaningful educators um, um, well-intentioned and uh, thoughtful, um, active, present educators. And uh, unfortunately, we've lost our fair share this year. Um, that's a great uh, hurdle that we have to, to overcome in this next year as we're projecting ourselves beyond uh, pandemic kind of academic lifestyle. So uh, I'm pleased that this budget, if uh, it's uh, funded by our city and county counterparts uh, would really position us to do that, to be competitive in, in, uh, in schools uh, across Virginia and across the country to attract the brightest and the best uh, educators. Um, and yeah, we are looking to retain um, other staff members, um, uh, cafeteria workers, bus aides and bus drivers, um, those that uh, are our custodians. Um, you know, we look at personnel every single meeting and uh, in closed session, and uh, I can't recall a time that I didn't see a custodian uh, offer a resignation and for, for various different reasons. And so we, we've got a lot of work to do to um, 
again, remain competitive in our, in our region. And I think that with your support, your continued support, I should say, uh, we'll be able to do that. I want to take a pause there and ask if there are any other comments or questions. So I don't Mayor have any Pons? questions, yes, but uh, just a, a general comment and observation. I think um, we're seeing the challenges that you all are facing in terms of retaining and attracting new employees is seen across the board, particularly people who are in this, this customer facing business, whether it's first responders, teachers, you know, it's, it's just a different dynamic after the, you know, with this pandemic. Uh, happening, but I, I would agree. And, and just yesterday, City Council, uh, you know, voted to increase pay for our first responders out of necessity. Some of these same challenges that you all are facing, and so um, I think we we all recognize that and, and ultimately support. Ultimately, would like to see a support of the budget to to increase the pay for these folks. Um, because they are educating our children. They're making a difference in our lives. And we want, we want this profession to be one that is rewarding and, and attracts new people to it. So um, thank you for the budget. Yes, sir, Mr. Nice Um Let me make one, uh, one sort of a question, if I will, and then I'll, I'd like to transition into a, an observation as, as uh, Mayor Pons has done. Um, and it had to do with your um, uh, the cost increased cost of medical and this was a question I have been discussing with the county administrator for our people as well because typically the employer picks up about 75 to 80 percent of the normal medical plan and uh, the employee picks up the rest and when an increase comes along uh, if that gets reversed a little bit where the bulk of that increase is now falling upon the individual as opposed to the the uh, organization that can have a, a pretty detrimental effect um, and I, I've as being the father of a school teacher I can tell you that many times she comes home and she tells me yeah it was nice I got a pay raise bad news is that it was all eaten up because I had to pay more for my medical so the net result was she got zero pay raise and I've, I've heard that from other other folks as well. Um, is that that's something you guys have wrestled with, I guess, and that's that's sort of what you're, you're you've come down with. I would I would offer. You, you might want to think about that. Um, and and let me go back to a personal observation. I have a, a a friend, a close friend, who was a retired military. Decided he wanted to get back into teaching. Highly technical. He's going to teach middle school math. Went back and got his degree, got his certification, was really excited to start James City County. He lasted about four months. And when I, I sort of asked, you know, what was it all about? Well, the pandemic was part of it. But the bottom line was he, he left because he did not feel supported. And I think it's really, really important for you to take a good close look. You know, you say that People are our, our most important asset. They really are. Uh, sometimes it's not just what you pay them. Uh, from my background in labor relations, I can tell you that work rules, working conditions, how people are treated is sometimes as important, if not more important, than financial compensation. So I'm, I'm glad to see the, the, the pay raises out there. I would like to see maybe you look at the, the medical aspect of it a little bit more. But I think you need to go back and ask yourself some really hard questions about how this has changed and why people are leaving or why people are not going to come back. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that they are short staffed. You've got people who are not regularly teachers, long term subs. You've got administrators filling in in classes. Um, I hear from my daughter that her planning period that she used to have during the, the class is no longer there. It has to do, uh, you know, she has to do her planning uh, on her own time outside of, uh, of school time where she used to have that. I think that kind of ultimate long term pressure, which the, your teachers are operating under, is a real critical factor in what's going to happen. And you guys are by no means, you know, pick, not picking on you. We have the same problem with all of our, all of our employees. Everybody does, the city and, and, and the county as well because it's a totally new new uh, era in dealing with people. I think people are just have, are feeling a little bit abused 
and you're going to have to make that connection with them in order to stem that problem. And that's just a, a little maybe too philosophical for you, but I, I, I think it's really important. I just I think that's something that I would like to see emphasized. Um, and I, I'm, I gather from your other thing I was talking about was um, the FTEs. If a lot of these were picked up during the pandemic, using pandemic money, and they understand that if it's not funded, that it goes, <clears throat> pardon me, it goes away. But you're basically making a transition of some of a lot of these folks uh, in, into full time. So this this is going to become something that's longer term. Um, I, I, I hope that's balanced um, because you know it's one of those things that it's, you, you've, you've, if you did it with it, with that kind of money, with the expectation that it would be there long term, that may or may not happen. Uh, and so that's what uh, I think you have to wrestle with uh, with some of the. Uh, when some of that money goes away. So those are my, my observations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eisenhower. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Hundley. I just have two comments. Um, good morning, everyone. I don't want to steal Mr. Snipes' thunder, but being um, that I retired from Stonehouse, and these aren't the right figures, but I remember when I helped open Stonehouse, there were four teachers per team. And Bright Beginnings had their wing as well. So I'm thinking we had about five, to, the capacity was either five to 600 students. And then I remember um, when my son um, entered school, he was in Bright Beginnings. And at that time in 2007, we had seven, seven to nine learning cottages. Because I remember he was in a learning cottage and all of Bright Beginnings was there. And then they, op they built wings on so um, that went from our capacity to about eight or nine hundred. Um, I'm not sure. I think the wings came on in 2010, somewhere in there, and um, we just continued to grow. So that's just those aren't the exact, <laughs> but those are the numbers. And also, um, it's just speaking with some of my former colleagues that have left the division or. Um, other divisions are stealing our, pe our, our teachers. They know they're awesome. <clears throat> they're offering them signing bonuses. And a couple of my colleagues that already live in Newport News, the cost of living, they're like, why not? And if they're at a Title I school, they're not paying out of pocket expenses for things they need for their classroom. So for example, just a real life experience, I mm -hmm. helped one of my colleagues move to a Newport News school and she had got a bunch of my stuff when I retired. And she said, do you have anyone else to give this to? Because when I went into her classroom to help her set up, she just had stuff like they, they get grants and funds. And she had all this stuff. She says, I have more stuff than I know what to do with. Can you please take all this back and give it to someone that needs it? So, um, and she was offered a $2,000 signing bonus to go to Newport News. And their um, compensation packet for um, health insurance is about the same. And she has a commute, and it's just lucky she's established here and she already has a house. But most teachers, uh, new teachers that come, say the cost of living for Williamsburg is very um, high. And so they tend to, to go to Newport News, Hampton, um, York County. Um, so that's one thing, definitely. And um, I appreciate everything that you said because spot on. So, but those are the only comments I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hundley. All right, looking around the room one more time. Dr. Heron, do you have any final comments? Just a final comment, just in response to, to Mr. Eisenhower. We, we are very aware of the climate in our schools right now, and a lot of it. Uh, every school superintendent is hearing the same kind of concerns because of what teachers have been through in the pandemic. We do have a plan for moving off the grant, and. You know, support for our teachers is not just money, it's class size, which we're, why we're bringing those eight teachers into the operating budget. Um, work climate is also what supports are there for students behaviorally and mental health so that teachers can actually teach, which is why we've pushed very hard to 250 to 1, and four of those were in the, in the ARA funds, and we're bringing them back into the operating budget this year. So there is a, there is a bigger picture to bring it all together. No, we're not perfect, but we certainly do support our teachers and try to do that in every way we can. 
Um, again, thank you for your incredible support of our schools because we're very, very fortunate in Williamsburg James City County to have uh, governing bodies who really support our schools. I want to thank you personally for that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Beers. Um, I, I just wanted to share um, a, a personal experience I had, I think that relates very much to um, what several people have said today. Uh, I was at a, one of the, I was at a big uh, construction type of place. I won't name the I won't name the company. Um, and there was a, a young woman in, ahead of me, um, and she was checking out. And the cashier said, um, "Are you with the military uh, or first responders?" And uh, she said, "No, I'm uh, um, I'm only a teacher." Um, and she did her stuff and went off and, uh, and I finished and I caught up to her and I said, and I said, you know, um, uh, I, it, you need to know that um, uh, we think you're just as important as, uh, as any of those other groups as well. And I said, it's unfortunate that um, some, we're not, you're not recognized in the same, in the same way. And, and I just think um, that, um, it, it, it is really important for our teachers to, to realize that they are just as important. They're vital, and um, and they they need to be recognized. And there, if there's room for a tiny perk for those teachers when they're checking out of some of those stores, then by golly, I I really would support that. But that's all I want. All right, uh, seeing no other hands or for a question or a comment, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens, for opening up the space for this meeting. And uh, it's been a great venue several times that I've been here. I want to thank our funding partners. I, I think we, everybody in the room, uh, especially on this side of the room, understands the great responsibilities that both bodies do have uh, to support your communities, the communities that we live in. And so I just want to say thank you for uh, just entertaining us and looking at our proposed budget this morning and uh, and for all of your continued support to our, our families that really are the greatest beneficiaries of your work. So thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments from Williamsburg James City County School Board, I want to call the school board meeting adjourned. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So I move that City Council adjourn. Second. Ms. Flico. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pond. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Madden. Aye. We have a motion to adjourn until 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, March 12th for the Board of Supervisors retreat at Legacy Hall. So, so moved. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Mr. Stevens, would you please call the roll? Uh, Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you guys. Thank you all.